Saúde. Direito de todos e dever do Estado. Direito à moradia, ao emprego, à educação, a um meio ambiente saudável, à água potável, ao lazer, à cultura. Direito à voz e à paz. Respeito à diversidade. Saúde para a Fundação Oswaldo Cruz abriga todas essas dimensões. É assim desde 1900. Uma visão integrada da saúde. Na pesquisa, ensino, assistência, informação, comunicação, memória. Na promoção da saúde, na inovação. Onde permanentemente se pensam respostas para as necessidades da sociedade. Onde se faz ciência em defesa da vida. Você pode até não saber mas carrega a Fiocruz dentro de você. Desenvolvemos e fabricamos vacinas, medicamentos, biofármacos, testes para diagnóstico. Formamos pessoas do nível médio a pós-graduação. Realizamos pesquisas para superar ameaças à saúde, para diminuir riscos ambientais, para prevenir doenças e agravos. Pesquisas que beneficiam crianças, adultos, idosos. Uma instituição pública e estratégica de estar, integrante do Sistema Único de Saúde, com uma rica história de contribuições à sociedade. Presente de ponta a ponta no Brasil, onde cada trabalhador é um elo forte e ativo. Nela, ciência e saúde cumprem uma função social para o país e o mundo. Pés fincados na tradição, olhos voltados para o futuro. Somos patrimônio da ciência e da saúde, da humanidade, do povo brasileiro. O Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, INCQS, foi criado em 1981. É uma unidade técnico-científica da Fiocruz que atua em áreas de ensino... áreas estaduais e municipais, entre outros entes. O INCQS é o único que realiza ensaios em lotes de sangue e hemoderivados utilizados no Brasil e é a instituição responsável pela análise laboratorial para a liberação de lotes de vacinas e de soros hiperimunes produzidos ou consumidos no país ou para exportação. O Instituto também avalia reagentes para diagnósticos, conjuntos, artigos e insumos para a saúde e para diálise, medicamentos, cosméticos, saneantes e alimentos, por exemplo, detecção de níveis de agrotóxicos de drogas veterinárias e de transgênicos e analisa amostras relacionadas à saúde ambiental. Além da atividade laboratorial, o Instituto emite pareceres sobre questões técnico-científicas relativas à vigilância sanitária. O INCQS é acreditado pelo Inmetro em diversos ensaios laboratoriais e serviços de calibração, tendo um sistema de gestão da qualidade consolidado e eficiente. Inclusive, é pré-qualificado pela Organização Mundial de Saúde nas áreas de medicamentos e vacinas. Este é o Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, na Fiocruz, contribuindo para fortalecer o SUS em benefício da população brasileira.
Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas da Universidade de São Paulo é uma referência nacional e internacional de qualidade no ensino, na pesquisa e nas atividades de cultura e extensão. Fundado em 1969, o ICB está localizado na cidade universitária, em São Paulo, com instalações em oito prédios. Possui ainda uma unidade na cidade de Montenegro, em Rondônia, e um posto avançado em Cruzeiro do Sul, no Acre. O ICB está estruturado em sete departamentos. Anatomia, Biologia Celular e do Desenvolvimento, Farmacologia, Fisiologia e Biofísica, Imunologia, Microbiologia e Parasitologia, os quais contemplam as principais áreas das ciências biomédicas. Nosso ambiente é multicultural e amplamente democrático. Aqui no ICB valorizamos a conduta ética, respeitamos a diversidade, incentivamos a consciência crítica e capacidade criativa dos nossos alunos, funcionários e professores. Em meio a esse universo multidisciplinar, o ICB completa seus 50 anos com uma excelência consolidada e busca formar cada vez mais profissionais que produzam conhecimento e inovação de modo a contribuir para o desenvolvimento da nossa sociedade. Seja você também parte do nosso Instituto. graduação, 400 estudantes de pós-graduação, 150 técnicos administrativos e 130 docentes. Juntos somos uma grande aglomeração. Aglomeração de trabalho, de pesquisa, de ensino, uma gigantesca aglomeração de conhecimento. E este ano nosso IBB faz mais um aniversário. Já são 57 anos de história. Mas esse aniversário é sem dúvidas não da forma como eu e você imaginávamos. Pois eu te pergunto, onde está todo mundo? Em meio a essa pandemia, fomos todos surpreendidos e de uma hora para outra transportados aqui para esse mundo virtual. Um mundo que a gente conhecia apenas como entretenimento, mas não era um mundo real para as nossas aulas, as nossas pesquisas e atividades de extensão. Até porque estávamos acostumados a conviver fisicamente, com os corredores, os departamentos, os laboratórios, sempre cheios. E aí, fomos todos virtualizados e nada mais era como a gente conhecia. Dá a impressão que perdemos a nossa identidade. Mas, na verdade, nós fomos desafiados. E, embora tenha sido muito difícil no começo, percebemos que temos uma essa capacidade de mudar, pois criamos novas conexões e novas maneiras de nos comunicar. Aprendemos a aprender e vimos que somos resilientes. Cada um com o seu conhecimento, com a sua dedicação, não mediu esforços para, num trabalho único, reconstruir o IBB que permanecesse além da sua estrutura física. Nós nos reinventamos. E nesse aniversário tão diferente, eu sei onde está todo mundo. Talvez nunca estivemos tão próximos. E com a certeza de que não importa qualquer outro desafio que nos espera, nós estaremos sempre aqui no IBB. Parabéns a todos nós! Nos dedicamos a ensinar, a inovar e a transformar por meio da ciência e da atuação social responsável. Essa é a missão há 45 anos, da Unesp, a Universidade Estadual Paulista. Uma jovem instituição, com 34 unidades, em 24 cidades do estado de São Paulo, 22 delas no interior, uma na capital e outra no litoral, em São Vicente. Essa ampla presença garante ensino de qualidade para mais de 50 mil alunos da graduação à pós-graduação. Estamos entre as universidades que mais produzem ciência no Brasil e temos orgulho de dialogar com as comunidades e compartilhar o resultado do nosso trabalho. Falar da Unesp é falar de todos e todas que ajudaram a tecer essa história em prol de um ensino público, inclusivo e de excelência. Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. 
Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos. É proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e principalmente com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável, que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para assim oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move. Porque para a Lesco, pesquisa é para a vida.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Of, uh, as, welcome to the webinar Zebrafish Experimental Model for Research. Sorry. My name is Rafael, and I'll be the chair of the lectures from today, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Luis uh, Assis. And uh, before we start, I would like to remind the audience that the link for the certificates will be posted at the end of the third lecture. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ambika Binesh. So Dr. Ambika Binesh is a, an, an assistant professor from the Department of Basic Science in Institute of Fisheries at Tamil Nadu, India. She's a Bachelor of Agriculture Science with Master Degree in Biotechnology. Besides that, She's an associate member of the International Society for Heart uh, Research, the National Academy of Biological Science, and the World Aquaculture Society. So welcome, uh, Dr. Ambika. So we lost her. Oh, no. Yeah, there, there you are. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambika. Can you share your screen with us, please? Yeah, thanks for connecting and I'm happy to be part of this webinar, Zebra Fish as Experimental Model for Research. So in this one, my topic is, next one, uh, is about the cardiovascular research, how this Zebra Fish model system is used in the cardiovascular research. So for my uh, presentation convenience, I grouped this one into um, seven, seven categories. Next one. So uh, first, uh, before getting into the zebra fish model system, I like to give some gist about this cardiovascular disease. So this World Health Organization um, reported that uh, almost this cardiovascular disease as the uh, top cause of death globally. And it is its number is uh, about 17.3 million deaths per year. And the number may grow up to more than 23.6 million by 2030. And combining all types of cancers, it takes more lives. For the first time, 1961, the British Heart Foundation was formed. This cardiovascular disease is no longer a, a leading cause of death in the United Kingdom, but it caused more death compared to cancer now. It is also an important cause of mortality and morbidity in India. So this data from the general of india they showed the cvd as a top five cause of death in different populations you may see like uh, a developed versus economically backward classes and also men versus women and also uh, middle-aged versus all age groups so getting into this my uh, topic zebra fish model uh, i for the presentation convenience next one presentation convenience i grouped this one into seven categories and I asked two questions, why and how. Next one. Hello. So I asked the two questions that is yes, why and how. So in the first three categories, it is all about the uh, cardiac development and morphogenesis and how to analyze the disorders of cardiac function and also cardiovascular mutant types. And how you will utilize this zebra fish model that is about for the vascular disease model and cardiac disease model. So the technologies like the genetic modification and also the imaging system, which enhances uh, the zebra fish model as an excellent model to study this cardiovascular research. Next. Next. So here, first we will see about this cardiac development and morphogenesis. So as we all know, this zebra fish uh, is have a single circulatory system, that single atrium and ventricle. It is highly similar to that of the mammalian system. So uh, 
it is also highly conserved so the special cell types and the structures that is known as the arteriovenricular wall aortic wall and also this coronary vasculation are all highly conserved and also the contributing cell types we know that one as the epicardium that is the um, outer protective layer and also the striated muscles that is the myocardium muscular layer and also the endocardium which helps in the smooth flow of the blood vessels so all these are highly conserved between the zebra fish and the uh, human types and also similarly the signaling pathways just you may say examples like akt jnk pathway and also notch and also um uh, jazz and map kinase p38 pathways and the morphogenetic processes that is the differentiation of the cells into the tissues organs and organ systems are all very well conserved that's why this zebra fish model is used to in investigate this cardiac development next one is about the cardiac functions so in the cardiac functions we will see how similar is the between this zebra fish and the human next slide so here you will see the similarities the heart rate of the zebra fish is highly similar to that of the human you may see this qt interval that is qrst waves that are highly similar and also this p wave that shows the difference and this ecg analysis clearly identifies this pqrs and t waves so that uh, demonstrates the comparable repolarization time that is the electrophysiology of the elect adult zebra fish heart is also similar to that of the human even though the embryonic zebra fish heart is uh, too small but nowadays the techniques are available to uh, do the ecg analysis from three days post fertilized to those onwards to that of the adult zebra fish so many of the key ion channels maybe you may say that sodium channel enclosed by this sg and phi a and potassium channels encoded by this kc and j3 and j5 all this govern the Ventricle acts, uh, ventricular action potential dynamics in humans have also orthologs in the zebra fish. Next one. So here uh, for the past two slides, we have seen how it will helpful in the cardiac development and also cardiac function. So here it will goes to the vascular developments. So vascular development mainly the vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. So here vasculogenesis means the precursor cells produce this endothelial cells and also de novo primitive vascular network. And also this angiogenesis means that is the um, formation of the new capillaries from the pre-existing blood vessels. All these uh, vasculogenesis, angiogenesis, and also the vascular remodeling requires tight regulation of the same key molecular pathways. Even though this cardiovascular system is the first to be formed in during the um, development of the zebra fish, uh, the embryos will take this adjacent by passive diffusion from water for the first few several days. So it, this future enables the experimental manipulations and it will be used as an cardiovascular mutant phenotypes, but it is lethal in humans and other mammals. So the important difference to be noted, that is the relative sparsity of the mural cells that is also seems to be highly conserved response to the vasculature that is particularly the vascular dilators and the constructors as well as to the cardiovascular drugs so next one so here uh, this research group uh, utilized this zebra fish larval system for uh, for this vasodilators and vasoconstructors so for, first here this epinephrine so this epinephrine uh, actually that can act as both vasoconstructors and also vasodilators but it is all depends upon the receptor. So this epinephrine, which it is mediated by this adrenogenic alpha mediators that will lead to the construction. If it is mediated by the beta receptors, then that will use to the vasodilation. So here, the chromaffin cells that will produce this epinephrine. So if the epinephrine is uh, more than 10%, con 10 times the normal concentration, then this calmodulin will uh, binds with the calcium. So this complex, that is the calcium calmodulin, uh, activates the myosin light chain pathway that will lead to the vasoconstruction. Next part, they used this uh, nitric oxide, that is the nitric oxide synthesis that is produced in the endothelium that produced the NO by using this L origin. So this NO, that is actually a uh, phosphorylate several proteins and also it initiates cascade of biochemical e uh, events that will make the smooth metal cells relax so that will lead to the vasodilation 
this research group also done uh, the using the envo inhibitor that is the l name that is that blocks the envo endogenously by competing with the l origin of envoys so this is how this research group used this gibberfish larva as an vasodilators and vasoconstrictors next one coming to this uh, cardiovascular drugs so cardiovascular drugs, this particular research group, they done a comparative analysis of this zebra fish, rat, dog, and also human. For this, they utilized three cardiovascular drugs that will modulate the beta adrenergenic and renin angiotensin systems. So the beta adrenergic means that will is that is the receptor of the myocardium that will regulate the function of the heart. And the renin in angiotensin, as the name indicates, it regulates the blood pressure by balancing the fluids and the electrolytes. So they done the comparative analysis and they found among all these uh, uh, model organisms, eight, about more than 80% of the drug combinations are largely comparable. That is the zebra fish and human responses for this. Thus by this zebra fish uh, shows this translational power. So, so far we have seen why it is used in the cardiac development and cardiac function and also in the cardiac mutant types. Next one. So uh, apart from all these similarities and also we, we will share this, 70% of the human genes share this ortholog with the zebra fish and also 82% of the human disease. And uh, we will say it is potentially used to examine the formation and function of the cardiovascular system non-invasively in a live organism. So it's a simple size, optical clarity, and also the high fertility and rapid development and affordability make this zebra fish as an attractive model to study, not only to study the cardiovascular research, but also to study all human diseases that thereby it replaces the study of rodents and other mammals. Next one. So literature survey shows more than 5,000 publications using this zebra fish in, since 2010. So I also done some meta-analysis using this involvement of signaling pathways in cardiovascular research using zebra fish model. Uh, here, the outcome of the study is that uh, United States ranks first in a uh, total publication output and particularly the uh, Harvard University, they do the intensive research in the signaling pathways using this zebra fish model. So out of this publications and the citations, the zebra fish is as a used as a cardiovascular disease, particularly in the signaling pathways, also gradually expanded from 2000. Is this due to this recapitulated pathophysiology of the human heart? Next one. So another uh, this uh, another advantages of this using this zebra fish model in the biomedical research is the ability to perform this genetic modifications that is a very easy case. So here the CRISPR Cas9 mediated gene editing that is very simpler to implement, and this gene expression that is transiently inhibited at protein level by EMVOs that means the morpholino oligonucleotides are in specific tissues using the CRISPR interface. So genetically, zebra fish has undergone partial genome duplication. So which can make to study the role of certain genes that is a more challenging due to this functional redundancy. But alternatively, this redundancy also advantageous in some contexts like the genes that express embryonically lethal in mammals can also be discovered by using this zebra fish. Next one. So in the recent years, this type of research is enhanced by the higher resolution and increased tissue penetration and the reduction of image artifacts in, by using this fluorescent microscopy and increased in vivo resolution by using this confocal microscopy. All these are used to get the data in anatomically depth and also the imaging duration we can do for hours to days. So, Gibrafish cardiovascular system can be visualized using a multitude of approaches, which ranges from the traditional in-situ hybridization in fixed tissues and to the real data analysis, that is the transgenic reporter lines, that is, which expresses the fluorescent proteins uh, both in cardiac and vascular specific cell types. So additionally, the optogenetic control of this cardiac function and also the capacity and the techniques available to analyze this endothelial cell calcium dynamics also sheds the lights in the cardiovascular studies. Next. There are so many risk factors coupled with this cardiovascular studies. Some risk factors that may as the age, heredity and the ethnicity that we cannot alter. Next, the other perils factors that can be treated. That means this high cholesterol, uh, sedentary lifestyle, alcohol consumption and the hypertension. All these can be altered. So there is an urge to 
study this peril factors, especially the LDL. Next, that is the low density lipoprotein. The elevation of this low density lipoprotein that precipitates the atherosclerosis. Next. So this atherosclerosis, this is the focus of my lab, mainly the macrophage differentiation. Next. So atherosclerosis, it is an inflammatory arterial disease that is narrowing down of the artery because of this enhanced uh, low density lipoprotein. Next, that. So this picture shows here how this uh, starts, the st it actually occurs in stages. So it starts with transcytosis of the LDL into the subendothelium, thereby it will uh, recruit more immune cells and it shows the endothelial modulation or the activation. So activated macrophages that will be developed into the foam cells and it and also leads to the fibrous plaque formation with calcification and finally lead, lead to the physical rupture of the plaque. So once it will happen, that will lead to the uh, thrombus formation and also lead to the myocardial infarction. So next. In cardiovascular research, uh, inflammation of these cardiomyocytes, smooth muscle cells, macrophages, and endothelial cells all leads to the cellular processes like the proliferation, differentiation, apoptosis, and also the immune response where this recruitment of monocytes and the macrophage play a role. So all these together leads to uh, inflammation in one way and another way it will lead to the fibrous plug formation. So next, though many cells and cellular processes are involved in atherosclerosis, macrophage differentiation plays the key role in initiation of atherosclerosis. So here we used the uh, rat model for uh, proving the endothelial dysfunction and atherosclerosis by using the high cholesterol diet. So um, compared to the control, if you see that uh, atherogenetic diet induced group, it shows high total cholesterol, triglyceroids, and also low density lipoprotein. So for this um, rat model, we used uh, the cholesterol and the cholic acid, and we treated the, fed the rat for almost four months to get this uh, dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, and also formation of the atheroma. The same thing, the another group, scientist group done in the zebra fish, they also showed this control and the high cholesterol diet group with the when compared to the control the high cholesterol diet group that is uh, shows significance so but for this they done only up to five days whole larva they fed for uh, 10 days uh, high cholesterol group this one is achieved so this takes so much of time for making the rat model as an atherosclerotic model but it is very uh, quick and easy response in using the zebra fish next one so uh, the low density lipoprotein which are uh, making the endothelial dysfunction that will absorbed by this histology of iota so if you see in the induced group the formation of the macrophages form cells and also the endothelial dysfunction so we used the oil red rose staining that also shows the endothelial dysfunction so same thing uh, that was used by this uh, scientist group and they showed in the zebra fish the lipid accumulation and also the iota disturbance that is the formation of atheroma in the dorsal iota so uh, uh, as i said earlier this will take the four months period to achieve in this rat model that is very quick in this uh, quick response in this zebra fish model next one so we also uh, for uh, mainly for atherosclerosis the macrophage accumulation and the differentiation is the main thing so in our uh, rat model system we used uh, the macrophage mac 387 uh, marker to show the macrophage differentiation in the right side of this picture in the zebra fish is just mentioned the five day old and the zebra fish uh, old larva fed with high cholesterol diet for just 10 days and this the red fluorescent cells indicates the uh, recruitment of the monocytes and the differentiation of the macrophage and also this blue color indicates that the l plastin that is the macrophage antibody that shows the differentiation of the macrophage next one so many studies and the various signaling pathways like JNK, AKT, P38 and Nosh and Jack state pathway, which are contributes individually to this monocyte and macrophage activation. But more recent studies shows that interaction of different pathways that leads to the progression of the disease. So there are much less studies reveal the, reveal the interaction in different pathways of monocyte and macrophage. So that is the focus of uh, the my lab now. So we did a uh, Nash pathway and also the crosstalk with the NF-kappa-B. Next one. So for this, we done 
all the parameters like the lipid parameters, uh, PCR studies, and also the Western blot analysis. Then finally, we go for this nuclear translocation study that is with using the immunofluorescent method. So for the in vivo, we used the RAT model, and for the in vitro, we used the monocyte cell line that is the THP1 cell lines. So uh, we done both this NICD, NICD that is the notch intracellular domain and also the nf kappa bp 65 that is the inflammatory mediator so in from this picture you can able to see the high intense nuclear translocation of both these transcription factors so next so um, to further to confirm this dependency of this nf kappa b and nicd we used the monocyte cell lines and induced with the oxy ldl so here you may see Next one, that is, you can see the co-translocation uh, co of this nf kappa b and NICD in the oxy-LDL induced THP1 cells. So further to confirm this one, we used the inhibitors to study this one. Next one. So this is the complete summary of our study. And um, the part above is the signal sending cell and below is the signal receiving cell. So this is the NASH pathway. This Delta 1 and JAG 1 are the uh, ligands of this NASH pathway and the NASH 1 is the receptor. And this gamma secretase that will cleave this NICD, that is the NASH intracellular domain, that will translocate into the nucleus and it will express the uh, target genes that says the HES1 and H1. So in our normal in vivo studies, we show this all these uh, molecules of this pathway, including this P65, are upregulated. So confirm this one. We like we done the molecular crosstalk between this P65 and the NICD by using the inhibitors. So for to inhibit this P65, we used the dexamethasone, and for the NICD, we used the DAPT. So that will inhibit the gamma secretase because that is cleaving this NICD, so that that will translocate in the nucleus. So First, we done this inhibition of the nf kappa b and checked for this expression of NICD and macrophage. So the inhibition of this P65 highly influenced this NICD expression and also the macrophage differentiation. But it is not the case in NICD because inhibiting this NICD that influences this macrophage differentiation but not this P65. So we also done both the inhibitors in the cells and find out both are in influencing the macrophage differentiation. So all these things we done in the THP1 cells and we confirm both this uh, cross, uh, there is a crosstalk between these two transcription factors. So right now my lab is doing this particular mechanism in the a zebra fish model next one next one So far, we have seen uh, why the zebra fish use, used as a uh, mod model for the cardiac uh, development and also cardiac function and also cardiovascular mutant types. And also we have seen how to investigate the vascular disease model, particularly the endothelial dysfunction and the atherosclerosis. Now, I am I like to share some about this, uh, how to investigate this cardiac disease models that was done by some of the researchers all over the world. This, this was done just to understand the cardiac defects so there are three categories in this one next one that is the congenital birth defects cardiomyopathies and the conduction defects so first one that is the congenital birth defects that will be studied by using the zebra fish mutants particularly by using the looping pattern next one so um so this congenital birth defect that causes almost approximately 1% of the live birth rates, it is because due to the structural malformations that has the septal defects or also the chamber problem and also valve degeneration. So heterotoxia syndrome, that is the uh, mutant, that is the zebra fish mutant having this heterotoxia is highly similar to that of the human. Heterotoxia syndrome means there is a, during embryogenesis, there is a problem in the left-right patterning of the body. So here they explained with this uh, D loop, S loop and no loop. So if it is a D loop means that is the uh, normal thing. If it is an S loop means that is reversed. If there is no loop formation means that means that the embryo embryogenesis there is a disturbance. So this mutant type is highly similar to that of the human types. So next one. Next one is about this cardiomyopathies. So here, the cardiac contractility that begins at the 24 hours post fertilization, that means the heart tube develops, then the sacromere assembly starts. 
once this uh, cardiac uh, contraction begins and leads to the 48 hours then the myofilament will mature and it shows two different types of uh, cardiomyocytes that means in the um, ventricle it shows the basal actin type of cardiac filaments and it also in the atrium it shows the transverse filaments that is the long perpendicular that is perpendicular to the flow of the blood so if, if there is any disturbances in this sacromere assembly that will lead to this cardiomyopathies there are three types of cardiomyopathies that is the dilated cardiomyopathy that means the ventricle valve enlargement and also it leads to the reduced cardiac output and thinning of the myocardial wall second one is the hypertrophic cardiopathy that is the ventricle wall thickening third one is the arithmogenic cardiovascular cardiomyopathy that means the cardiomyocyte degenerate and also gradually it will replace the fibro fatty scar tissues and also this will lead to the structural modeling in the heart and also the heart loses its function so next one first we will see about this uh, so for studying all this uh, cardiac disease models like co congenital disease um, birth defects, cardiomyopathies, and conduction defects, scientists used only the zebrafish mutant types. So this zebrafish mutant types or the misexpression models are basically utilized to study all these types. So here you may see there is a mutation in the TN, TTNB, BGA3, ILK, and also um, ILK in the uh, ACM, that is the arithmogenic cardiomyopathy. So if it's the mutation in TTN, that will lead to the uh, disturbances in the sacromere assembly so that is associated with this dilated cardiomyopathy so if the mutation the it occurs in the n terminal it shows severity in the cardiac defects if it in the case of c terminal that will affect the cardiac and the skeletal defects next mutation that is um, next one so this BGA3, that is the BCL2 associated anthenogen 3, that is an heat shock protein. This BGA3 is not, you, this is not an all group used this BGA3 knockout model zebra fish larvae. And it shows in the second picture, you may see the epicardi, uh, uh, sorry, pericardial edemia. And also it uh, leads to the hypochondractility problem. So these people done the functional analysis of this single myofibrils and they proved this BGA3 mutant, uh, BGA3 is required for the normal heart contractility. Next one. So next is about this ILK, that is the extracellular matrix of the cytoskeleton, that is laminin, integrin or linked kinase. So this ILK mutation that will also lead to this dilated cardiomyopathy. Some heterogeneous mutations in this um, ILK also associated with the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So this research group showed the ILK mutation will lead to the ca cardiac contractility. So here in, you see in the picture A, uh, they used the wild type cardiomyocytes and they transplanted into the normal uh, wild type uh, ventricle walls of the zebra fish then they see that one is normal cardiac cell type normal uh, i mean normal cardiomyocytes if the ilk mutant uh, cardiomyocytes are uh, uh, transplanted into this uh, ventricles of the cardio uh, ventricles of the zebra fish then you will see flattened and apparent uh, types of cardiomyocytes by this way they proved this ilk mutation also lead to this uh, cardiac contractility so this msq that is called as the main squeeze that also uh, that is a mutant allele in the uh, kinase domain of this ilk so this uh, pkb that is the uh, phosphorylation of this pkb down regulated down regulated in msk mutants so the injection of this um, pkb that also restores the heart contractility so by this way the scientist group proved that phosphorylation of the pkb is very impo important it is required for the card development so this msq the main skews a mutant that is used as a tool to screen the compounds which restores the heart contractility next one so so far we have seen 
um, why it is used that means in the cardiac development cardiac function and also cardiovascular mutants and how it is used we will see the vascular disease model that is the endothelial dysfunction and the atherosclerosis now we are seeing how uh, how it is uh, used in the cardiac disease model that means first we seen about this uh, congenital birth defects next one about the cardio uh, sorry cardiomyopathy third the last one that is the conduction defects so if there is any disturbances in the electrical impulse that is the sino arterial node throughout the heart that will lead to the long qt syndrome or short and also arterial fibrillation sick sinus syndrome so this picture shows um, uh, there is a, some slight differences between this P wave, but the QRS that measures this QT interval, that is the repolarization time, that is similar to that of human and the zebra fish. So the scientist group used this zebra fish mutants, that is the uh, breakdowns model that will used as a uh, long QT syndrome. That means there is a mutation in the potassium ion channel, so that will block the AV node. And uh, they used the Riga mutant types that will. Uh, uh, block the sinus node instead of the AV block. Actually, the scientists, this group uh, formed this mutant as a first model to study the SQTS. So these zebra fish mutant models are used to study these conduction defects. Apart from this conduction defects, cardiac pacing, cardiac pacing also plays a very important role. So here you may see two types of cardiac pacing that uh, wild type is the normal rhythm so arterial fibrillation means there is an irregular rhythm six sinus syndrome means there will be a long pause in this rhythm so if you see in the picture you will see that white dot lines that will shows the each cardiac cycle and also the blue lines that will indicates the cardiac uh, contraction intervals so in the normal one it shows the regular rhythm but in the mutant type that is the uh, pitx2 mutant type that is shows the arterial fibrillation there it shows the irregular rhythm with the you may see that blue line that there is an irregularity in that one the same way uh, gnb5 and other some mutations in that uh, that are all mutant types are used to study this six sinus syndrome that means there is a long pause in this uh, rhythm next one so uh, so far we have seen all the why it is studied and how it is used to study the um, vascular disease model and also the cardiac disease model uh, even though it has some limit limitations that is high throughput screening is limited to the water soluble compounds that means it is very challenging to predict that how much we have administered and how much that is exposed that although some uh, robotic injection methods are available to inject the uh, inject in the zebra fish yolk but this micro injection in the blood circulation is less amenable to this high throughput screening and also another one uh, major limitation is that lack of standardized protocols. Whatever you will standardize, there is always some experimental variability and also reproducibility. So all these uh, limitations is not only for to study the cardiovascular model, it is a limitation to all types of human disease models. Apart from this, particularly for the cardiovascular research, the lack of chamber septation and also the ion channel and the uh, ventricular action potential dynamics, there is a slight differences between this human and the zebra fish. So uh, if a researcher is going to start in the research in the cardiovascular, that they have to keep in mind that these two points in pharmacological research. Even though a lot of limitations, uh, eight compounds were uh, discovered and they gone into the clinical trials by using this zebra fish as a model organism. So next. So to finally, so far we have seen how it is used and why it is used. So finally, this genetic and pharmacological models and even the uh, live uh, in vivo imaging, that is we can view the non-invasively, that is the main benefit and also the electrophysiological analysis of the cardiac function and uh, recently the optogenetic cardiac function, high throughput screening all together makes this zebra fish as an excellent transplant model. Mm, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ambika. Very interesting, uh, your presentation and your research topic. And it uh, shows us that zebrafish can indeed be an excellent uh, research model. So we, as I was um, uh, changing the slides, um, let's see we if we have questions, probably yes. 
So maybe my co-chair could help me with that. Yeah, uh, we have here a question from uh, Monica Rodriguez Ferreira Machado, and uh, she asks for uh, Dr. Uh, Ambika, uh, if you want to evaluate here frequency during a, a ZET at 48 hours, the uh, cardiomyocytes are working in uh full work or maybe uh you should wait until 72 hours uh it's a very good question but actually this is about this uh, frequency that is related to the cardiomyopathies and also conduction defects but my uh, research area is only in the atherosclerosis that is the vascular disease model and i'm afraid i am not the right person to answer this cardiomyopathy related questions mm -hmm. I think we have a question for from Natalia Feitosa. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Is NFK B B yeah, six six five <laughs> and NIC is specific yes. to macrophages? Yes, we are doing the specific, that is the P65, that is the inflammatory mediator, and the NICD, that is also a transcription factor in the notch pathway. That means the notch intracellular domain that is cleaved by this gamma secretase and they are translocated into the nucleus that will express the targets. So we are doing only specific of to this, of these two pathways, particular to the macrophage differentiation. Mm. more questions uh, Luis? yeah i would have one but it's just a curiosity uh it's because well uh in uh humans uh, uh you can correct me if i'm wrong uh we have the tendency to develop this uh cardiovascular disease uh uh in uh late ages yeah so uh how to uh, reproduce that on zebrafish? I mean, when you uh, make a knockout fish, for example, to study a, a vascular disease, which age do you investigate the development of these uh, cardiovascular problems? Do you wait until a certain age, like until the fish is senescent, like one year or two years old? Or uh, do you look uh, only at the the developmental at developmental uh, stages and also the beginning of life uh, of the fish. Uh, uh, how uh, is that work? Uh, it's really a nice question, but actually for humans, we are having a lot of things uh, uh, plays role in the development of the atheroma, that is the atherosclerosis, like our sedentary lifestyle and also the intake and also alcohol consumptions and and also the unaltered things like the age, hereditary, everything plays a role. But Jeepra fish model, uh, all the scientists all over the world, they are utilizing their embryos, larvae and adult, everything in this model because they are just making that mutant models to study that mutant models are actually similar to that of the human. If a human is having some uh, cardiac contractility problem, that will be just they will make in the zebra fish, uh, uh, I mean in the larvae stage itself, five days old. That's what I told, just they fed 10 days of high cholesterol diet. With that one, they established that particular model that is very easy in that one. So with that, they will treat some drugs. Then that with that one, they will conclude how the treatment will be for the humans. Mm, nice. Thank you very okay. much. We have uh, maybe one last question from uh, Evis. Uh, he said, excellent lecture. Have you studied any gene related to arrhythmia in zebrafish? Um, no, actually, for the past two years, we are using the zebra fish model. That is particularly, I told, we are trying to study the interactions of this P65, that is the inflammation, and also this cell differentiation, cell fate differentiation, you may say, that is the NICD. So we have just started and they, we have a long way to go, but we are not still concentrating on, in this uh, cardiomyopathies. Okay, we have more one more question, maybe. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, from a uh, uh, funny nickname, uh, 
Gam, uh, series of number, Gamze Turan. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ambika, could you please explain more about the limitation of uh, lack of protocols? Uh, zebrafish strain, uh, husbandry, uh, experimental design, etc. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I also mentioned in the slide there is some mm -hmm. limitations in that one. Uh, one limitation I also explained that uh, we are administrating the drugs into the water. Some are water soluble compounds, the drugs we are administrating, but we don't know how much the zebra fishes are ex exposed to the uh, drugs. So always there isn't some uh, confusions how that model was set up. With the standardized protocols also, there is an experimental variability and it is very difficult to reproduce the results. So it's a, it's an ectotherm, there is a temperature controlled system. So always some problem with these limitations. Still, it needs to be standardized in the protocols. Okay, I think that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ambika. And uh, again, um, I apologize for the technical problems, but uh, your your presentation was really great. Thank you very much for your uh, for your um, uh, viability to be here with us and uh, during this morning or afternoon in India. And uh, thank you very much. Thank and now you. We I like to thank the organizers, uh, even though some technical problems we then. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah. if anyone wants to contact uh, Dr. Ambika, uh, probably, yeah, I think uh, she can uh, send an email or you can uh, Google it easily, yeah. right? Yes. Thank you very much. And now we, we have to move on. And uh, I will uh, introduce my co-chair, Dr. Luis. Dr. Luis um, has, uh, uh, is a biologist uh, from uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais. He did his master in uh, cell biology and also a PhD. He has uh, two second, two uh, PhDs, uh, one uh, almost finished. Uh, and uh, Dr. Luis uh, did his second PhD at the uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands with uh, Dr. Rudiger Schutz as a supervisor. So Dr. Luis, welcome. Thank you. Our speaker. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Rafael. Uh, thank you, everybody that uh, is here uh, with us today. It's an incredible uh, opportunity. So thank you all uh, uh, subscribers and also uh, thank you, uh, a special thank you to the organization that invited me to be here today. And it's, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next uh, talk because as Hafa said, uh, we still have a close relationship. Dr. Rudger Schuss is my uh, supervisor, my second PhD. Uh, and but it's going to be a little bit different from our uh, talk so far because uh, we will uh, put for you a, a recorded presentation. But don't worry because uh, Dr. Hutka Schuss will be here with us at the end of the uh, the presentation to answer all the questions that you may have, okay? So let me uh, tell a little bit about Hudge. Uh, Hudge uh, did both his master uh, and a PhD at the University of Ra. I, I think it's pronounced that way, uh, in Germany. He is from uh, Germany. And after that, uh, he moved to the Netherlands, uh, where he is now uh, an associate professor from the Department of Biology uh, at the Utrecht University. Uh, he works with the in the Reproductive Biology Laboratory using zebrafish as an uh, experimental model. Uh, he extends his research in collaboration with other groups for example, uh, the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen, Norway, where he also holds a position 
is studying economically relevant species such as the Atlantic salmon that we like to eat so much. His main research question is how do hormones and growth factors regulate the proliferation and differentiation behavior of germ cells, in particular of spermatogonial stem cells. He investigates what modulates uh, the production and release of hormones uh, regulating spermatogenesis, in particular FSH, the follicular stimulant hormone. Uh, and uh, paracrine factors derived from the uh, stem cells environment. Cell types contribute, uh, contributing to this environment are Sertoli cells, myoid, lighty, and endothelial cells that are close to the spermatogonial stem cells and contribute to the stem cell niche. The production and release of these factors uh, is modulated by the reproductive hormones studied by uh, Professor Rudger Schuss, such as the FSH and also androgens. Uh, so uh, we have now a really interesting uh, uh, lecture. I think we can uh, go on with that, Hafa, if we can uh, start the presentation. Uh, he will talk about endocrine and paracrine control of this behavior of spermatogonial stem cells. So I think we can start. Yeah. Thank you, Luis. So we can start our, the presentation. And regulation. Fish spermatogenesis today. Uh, if you want to see more about the background of, of our group, you can use that link here. And that gives an impression on the setting where we are in Utrecht on the campus. This is my, my major uh, uh, position, so to speak. But as uh, Manix mentioned, I have an uh, additional position at the, universe, at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen at the west coast of Norway. And here is an aerial photo of uh, the harbor area. And this high rise here in the background, that's the building of the Institute of Marine Research. And in this uh, Institute of Marine Research, uh, there is um, an important part uh, of the Institute is directed towards research in uh, reproduction of Atlantic salmon, because this species is very relevant for the aquaculture industry in Norway. Now, about 80 kilometers to the north of Bergen, there is a very small place called Matre. And in this place, Mata, there is a research, uh, second, well, research place of the same institute. And that reaches from these towers where water uh, is uh, produced and prepared over this stretch of buildings here. And if you uh, take uh, another view, uh, then here you have these towers again. And this stretch of buildings, this is the Matra Research Station, where all the work with the salmon is taking place. This is the best uh, uh, salmon research station I have seen in Europe, and I'm glad to be able to collaborate with these people there. So in Utrecht, we use this experimental model, the zebrafish, and uh, that is for our basic research. And this is how it looks like in a typical zebrafish laboratory. And of course, that is quite different from the salmon and from the setting where you work in, uh, in the salmon, because uh, here is a fjord, and this is the experimental uh, salmon aquaculture facility that uh, is in Matra, where we do the experiments. So it is quite nice to be in so different environments because uh, here we have uh, thousands of fish, uh, each weighing one gram, and uh, that's quite a different size if you compare it to this, what will it be, six, seven kilogram uh, of salmon here. So it's nice to uh, be able to live in two worlds, if you wish. Okay, so I was mentioning that the research interest into stem cells and then particular spermatogenic stem cells, so those cells who are responsible or require for male fertility, um, provides the intersection between the basic and the applied research. 
But I would also like to make the point that the, the term applied research is slightly misleading because the applied questions that we study are just one question away from the next basic research question. Usually you, you come to the next uh, basic research question when you go into the details of an applied research. Okay, so we are interested in, in the question how hormones and growth factors uh, regulate spermatogenesis. And as you will be aware, these, uh, these are molecules with which uh, cells communicate in our body. So the success of spermatogenesis depends on the close collaboration between two germ cell types, and then these communication factors play a role in that. And these uh, cell types are, of course, germ cells on the one hand, but germ cells can do little, astonishingly little, unless they are supported by somatic cells. And the most important cell type in that context are the Sertoli cells. So without the support of the Sertoli cells, the germ cells immediately become apoptotic and are lost. But with the support of Sertoli cells, they can go through an amazing developmental process that uh, provides sperm the basis for male fertility. So we have a stem cell population and that stem cell population provides lifelong fertility in males. And the endocrine system in vertebrates has assumed sort of master control position over the activity of, reproduct of the reproductive system, including the activity of the spermatogonial stem cells. Now there are three or four main types of activity that the spermatogonial stem cells can have. And the first one is to do nothing. So they're quiescent. In other words, they do not do anything, not even dividing. And that is the typical feature of many stem cells. They show a much slower uh, speed of cell cycling than more differentiated cells. And uh, one explanation for that is uh, to realize that each time a cell divides, you need DNA replication. That is inevitably connected to making some mistakes. So some point mutations are always uh, taking place when there is a DNA duplication taking place. And if you reduce the frequency of cell cycling, you reduce the chance of uh, making mistakes. So that's one of the ways the stem cells protect the genome is to not use it too often. When they do enter cell cycling, however, stem cells have to decide if they, when dividing, produce a new stem cell, a second stem cell, that is then called so-called self-renewal, or if when dividing, they produce differentiating progenitors that then usually in a certain developmental process provide the cells that are required. In our case, sperm cells, but there are many tissue specific stem cell types in our body. So that will then differentiate to a liver or a lung cell or what have you. And of course, as for many other cells, there is the, uh, the last way out, and that is to um, activate apoptosis, and then the cell is lost due to cell death, which usually occurs when the spermatogenic cells, when the germ cells lose contact to the somatic cells, then apoptosis is no longer suppressed and the cells are lost. Okay. So now, interestingly, while the endocrine system modulates the activity of spermatogonial stem cells, the receptors for the hormones produced by the endocrine system, they are not expressed by the germ cells, but they are expressed by these companion somatic cells. So we have the situation that the hormones produced by the endocrine system, they regulate the activity of somatic cells and the somatic cells, for example, the Sertoli cells, the most important ones here, they then produce close range paracrine communication factors with which they translate, so to speak, the endocrine information to the germ cell, which then responds by either remaining quiescent or 
uh, entering cell cycling, but having to decide, will it be self-renewal or will it be differentiation? So with our research is devoted towards the question, how this transition from the endocrine to the paracrine communication is organized, and in particular, so what is the identity and the function and the regulation of production of these factors that are organizing the communication. And these are either growth factors, and I will give you examples about the insulin-like family and the wind family and TGF beta family. But there are also other local factors, for example, growth factor binding proteins that then modulate again the activity of the growth factors or uh, short, uh, uh, short range acting lipophilic molecules like prostaglandins and retinoic acid. All these points that I mentioned here, we studied, but I will mainly uh, give you examples today for these growth factors and not so much about growth factor binding proteins, prostaglandins, retinoic acid. If you want to see more about this, uh, just go to the um, internet address that I've shown on the first slide and, and you find links to all these papers. Okay, so in the most recent research activity, we are uh, changing the point of view slightly, but I will not talk about this. It's just to sh show you what we are busy with right now, because we're just starting up this research, so there's not much I can, I can show you there. But all these work that we have done so far usually is directed towards understanding how the somatic compartment talks to the germ cells. But we are realizing more and more that the germ cells are also talking back, but very little is known about them. So we will start exploring the germ to soma signaling, while so far we mainly focused on the soma to germ signaling. This is one point. Uh, the other point, the applied point, is that we uh, are doing work to control male fertility, and that is the main background uh, to which we come towards the end of uh, my presentation, which refers to salmon aquaculture. Okay, so all this is about spermatogenesis that is uh, based upon the spermatogonial stem cells. So let's start by having a look at this uh, process. And what we start with is that we take a look at what spermatogenesis is, uh, afterwards how it is regulated, and then we go into some sort of detail. Uh, first chat appearing, good. <laughs> Let's see if that is a question that requires. Is it known why germ cells don't have reproductive hormone receptors? No. Let me see. I can just speculate about that. It is not known, but I can like suck it out of my thumb at the spot. Uh, much of the short range communication molecules, the paracrine molecules uh, that are regulated by the endocrine system, but are produced locally in the testes and then talk at a short range uh, between somatic cells and the germ cells, they are also found in invertebrates. For example, many of them are found in Drosophila or in C. elegans. But in invertebrates, you do not have this master control system of an endocrine system that regulates all that. So in vertebrates, in all vertebrates, you find puberty. You find the hypothalamus and the pituitary that is regulating reproduction. You don't have that in Drosophila, for example. You have the local signaling system. So my hypothesis would be that during evolution, the endocrine system has assumed control over the local signaling system by making use of mechanisms to regulate the paracrine activities by targeting the cells that produce the local factors, which are the somatic cells of the gonads, also in invertebrates. But there they function locally without input from the brain and the pituitary because they don't have a pituitary, and the brain does not directly regulate it. So that would be my, my uh, speculatory answer. Maybe it's for more fine tuning protection of germ cells, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. 
So when going back to the question, what spermatogenesis is, it's uh, a cellular development uh, with three main phases. Uh, we come to these phases and the main purpose of it is to provide a large number of spermatozoa. And it's based on a small number of spermatogonial stem cells to give you a um, uh, brief impression. What is a large number? Uh, think of your own species, Homo sapiens, and the daily sperm production after puberty is roughly about 100 million sperm cells per day. So there's a lot of mitosis that has to be organized to produce that. And that will start during puberty and will only end once you lay in the coffin. And it's every day 100 million cells. So that is what is required to be organized. So there are three main phases. And in order to get to this large number of cells, you have in particular the mitotic phase in which you have more or less regular mitotic cell divisions, which means you have one stem cell. And when this one stem cell divides on the differentiation path, it will produce two daughter cells they will divide, produce four, eight, 16, and so forth. So with each cell cycle, a duplication of the number. So interestingly, the number of mitotic cell cycles uh, uh, that is used is genetically determined. So it's invariable per species. So if you want to produce more or less germ cells, that only means that you can you, that means you cannot decide to have a few more mitotic rounds. You can only send more stem cells into the differentiation process, but then they go through a fixed determined development process. So this mitotic phase uh, geometrically expands. So that's how the math people call it. One, two, four, eight, sixteen is a geometrical growth. Uh, geometrically expands the spermatogonial number. And once you... Uh, uh, do that, then you, you get quickly to big numbers. So at the very beginning, there has to be the decision of, will it be a differentiation path? And you go this way, or is it self-renewal? Then there is one more stem cell. So this is one of the decisions we are interested in. Another point, and that's why I said it is more or less a normal cell division, is that there is one thing that is not normal with these germ cell mitosis is, and that is the following. Now, if my fist is one cell, then it grows. And when it divides, usually a cell will form at the end of the cell cycle, cytokinesis, and will be separated. And you have two individual separate cells. If it is, however, a differentiating division, so if the germ cell goes this way, then what, during the cytokinesis, you do get a separation, but they are not terminally separated. They stay connected by a cytoplasmic bridge. So we get a pair of cells. And if they divide, you get a chain of four cells, then a chain of eight. So they stay interconnected, which is called clonal proliferation, and which also implies that via these cytoplasmic bridges, differentiating germ cells are synchronized in their development within the clone. So if you see two germ cells in different stages of development, that means they are different, they're members of different clones. Okay, so a mitotic phase provides a high number of cells. Then of course you need meiosis that is related to two specialized cell cycles. And uh, at the end of that, the cell number increase is done. So there's two more cell cycles during meiosis. And then in the third and last phase, the so-called spermiogenic phase, um, proliferation is blocked. And what we see is uh, that normal looking cells, uh, haploid spermatids then develop, differentiate into motile sperm. So they throw away most of their organelles, they keep a few mitochondria, they keep their Golgi apparatus because they turn it into something else, and they develop a flagell, but the rest is thrown away and they become motile spermatozoa. Okay. 
So developmental process in three phases, and we will look at mainly the mitotic phase in particular at the beginning of that. And we sort of uh, just accept that the other phases are there as well. So next question is how it is regulated. We have heard that reproductive hormones play a big role and we'll hear that one of them, one of the two gonadotropins follicle stimulating hormone is uh, most important. Sex steroids are also very important. And they interact with their receptors on somatic cells, as we've heard. Uh, and these somatic cells then convert it to paracrine signals. The most important somatic cell being the Sertoli cells, which are strictly required also for providing physical and nutritional support. And as soon as the germ cells lose contact to Sertoli cells, they uh, lose the constant suppression of apoptosis provided by Sertoli cells and die. Now this, sorry, this is nothing uh, special as we will see because in zebrafish only about 60% uh, of all the cells that enter the process also finish it. So quite some loss is typical for spermatogenesis. But fish by losing only 40% are good. In humans, for example, it's rather 60 or 70% that's lost. So, that, but that can again vary between species. Okay, so the Sertoli cells are really important and that's why we take a closer look to them. Um, there's a paper that I've written together with a number of international colleagues, uh, uh, review on spermatogenesis in fish which uh, in which you find this uh, figure and that shows you the developmental process through which the cells go and in fish that is typically taking place in so-called spermatogenic cysts what is meant by that is that it starts with a single stem cell as you see here and then the single stem cell is a packaged enveloped by one or two Sertoli cells, these dark blue or purple cells here. So you have, uh, say, a gem, uh, stem cell, and then the other hand is a Sertoli cell, and that wraps itself around the stem cell. That's where it starts with one or two of these Sertoli cells. And then if you have a clonal differentiating division, you get two, four, eight, 16, and so forth. So the number of germ cells increases and here you see an indication for this cytoplasmic bridge. And while that is the case, the Sertoli cell group that accompanies this single stem cell also has to grow because with each division, you get the duplicate number of cells. So the whole thing has to grow, otherwise the cyst will burst. So in the cyst experiment with genesis, Sertoli cells form compartments within the germ cell tubuli, they create the environments that their germ cell clone has optimal conditions to develop. And they accompany their clone through the development, during which period they also have to proliferate because the cyst grows. So the Sertoli cells have to increase in number as well. And in fact, there is two types of uh, Sertoli cell production, uh, uh, proliferation. One is if you need a new cyst going through the process, you need to have one single stem cell and at least one, often two Sertoli cells to accompany this new stem cell through the process. So for cyst production, you need, you need Sertoli cell proliferation. And to accompany a growing cyst, you also need Sertoli cell proliferation. Now this we found out by uh, studying in detail cell numbers during zebrafish spermatogenesis, which is here in this paper. And then here you see the number of germ cells in these cysts. So it goes from one to two to theoretically four, but once in a while one is lost to eight, 16. So here's the theoretical numbers. And sometimes the number is, uh, and not sometimes, uh, the number is always somewhat lower. And the difference is the loss due to apoptosis that occurs. And this growing cysts are made possible because the, also the Sertoli cell number increases from one to two to three to four and so forth to about 12, 13 when you get to meiotic stages. 
So there is a predictable constant ratio between germ cell and Sertoli cells for certain stages of development. So this functional unit of the fish and the amphibian testes, by the way, is uh, the spermatogenic cyst uh, in which one clone goes through its development. When the development is finished, the cyst opens, the sperm are uh, set free into the lumen of the tubulus, uh, like you see here, and then uh, can be used for fertilization. And the cyst is formed by Sertoli cells. And, uh, you do not have a chance to um, change the number of mitotic divisions, it's uh, fixed, but you can change the number of units that go into the process. So that determines sperm production capacity. So what we have in fact here at the beginning is a stem cell niche that you have in many tissues. And in mammals, for some reason, these spermatogonal stem cells are motile but also the mammalian test is organized differently, not in the cysts or in fish and amphibia. Uh, the Sertoli cells are not motile, they are sitting within the cyst. So when they start to differentiate, that is uh, because the signaling coming from the Sertoli cells is changing. So we have, and that's so far an assumption, we still have to provide experimental proof for that. So we think that in fish and amphibia, we have a dynamic niche. That means the signaling of the niche changes from supporting stem cell self renewal to supporting differentiation. And that is not, not the stem cell itself that is dynamic and can walk away like you have in mammals. Now, the situation is exemplified here in, uh, in a salmon testis that is just about to enter maturation. So if you want to have new niche space, you need new Sertoli cells that are not yet in contact with germ cells because you need vacant Sertoli cells to take care of a new stem cell. So in a testis, just at the beginning of puberty, you see areas where there is only Sertoli cell nuclei here, for example. Here's another area, only Sertoli cell nuclei. And the relatively low, low number of germ cells is surrounded by already quite a number of Sertoli cells. But still here we have a, a section from the same testis, but now stained for proliferation activity. So the brown nuclei are proliferating cells. And here, for example, you have just one germ cell already surrounded by one, two, three, four, five Sertoli cells, but there is another Sertoli cell again proliferate. So in the beginning, you have um, many Sertoli cell proliferation activity taking place. We believe that the vacant Sertoli cells produce signals favoring stem cell self renewal. So you produce uh, more cysts that then go into the spermatogenic process. Now in zebrafish, we have found that there are nine mitotic cell cycles and that these nine mitotic cell cycles give you 512, theoretically, it's a little bit less because of apoptosis, uh, spermatogonia. They then go into meiosis, two more divisions. So you end up with a little bit more than 2000. They go through a differentiation process while proliferation is blocked. So first the mitotic proliferation, then meiosis, then spermiogenesis to end up with, in reality, about 1300 uh, sperm cells, so about 40% is lost. So this, the graphical representation, this is the actual section. And here you have, for example, differentiating type A spermatogonia, these are type B spermatogonia, and these are spermatocytes. You have to learn to see that and then uh, we come to the conclusion that sperm production depends on the number of spermatogenic cysts entering a relatively fixed developmental process that can be modulated by determining the number of units going into it. Okay, so how do you measure that? The different possibilities. One is morphological measurement, provides rock hard data, but is very cumbersome and time consuming. 
So you make several sections. You need to know what you see. You need to know that this is, for example, a stem cell. Here is another one. These are differentiating type A spermatogonia, type B, and so forth, uh, as indicated. Then you uh, take 10 of this kind of sections and you overlay them with a uh, digital grid, and then you determine for each uh, intersection point what is the cell type below that. So you quantify the so called volume fraction or the percent surface area that is taken by a certain cell type provides very, very good data, very low variation, but is taking a lot of time and you need to learn to know what you see. So we were also looking for other possibilities like frequency of cysts. In this example, we exposed fish to estrogen, which blocks the brain pituitary system and spermatogenesis breaks down so that within two weeks, you have half of the test's weight left. And when you uh, look at how uh, the different germ cell cysts are represented in the white, you see uh, the control situation. So all the different cells are there. But if you block the brain pituitary system, you see an accumulation of the early cells and all the differentiated ones are very low. Still requiring uh, quite a lot of counting. So how about molecular analysis. So we use qPCR analysis for marker genes. And that works fine when it comes to later stages. For example, spermatocytes, there's a marker gene synaptonema complex that you find in spermatocytes or for spermatids, that works really nice. But for spermatogonia, we don't have good marker genes yet. We're working on it now because we are starting single cell RNA sequencing as it is called. So we get a much better impression of the specific gene expression patterns of the different spermatogonial generations. And that will hopefully enable us to get rid of the cell counting and do PCR analysis instead. Another way of quantifying spermatogenesis is to quantify proliferation. And that you see here, we have uh, here brown stained nuclei that indicate that these cells were in the S phase of the cell cycle. So here's a control situation, not very many brown cells. And here's a situation where we added a growth factor that will come back in a minute. And then she's much more proliferation. So that can be quantified and is also a very nice way of analyzing it. Okay. So we focus on the early spermatogonia because this is uh, where the action takes place when it comes to regulating spermatogenesis. And this is also the point where the uh, process takes place relevant for cell reproduction. We have learned that the endocrine system regulates the timing of the transition from immature to maturing animals. So it determines when puberty is taking place. And it also determines the activity after puberty of the stem cells that can either no longer be supported, so they will die, they remain quiescent, they do self-renewal divisions, or they do differentiating divisions. So the applied aspect, as mentioned, is salmon aquaculture. And there is two points that are relevant to mention here. And I will do that before we come uh, to the uh, details of regulation of uh, zebrafish spermatogenesis. OK, so two points. One is. Puberty in salmon is an animal welfare problem connected to a sustainability problem. And another one is that there's always some SKPs from these uh, aquaculture facilities. And if these are sexually competent animals, then that can lead to so-called genetic introgression from uh, strains used in aquaculture into natural populations, which is considered a severe ecological problem. In fact, the last one is the main reason why the Norwegian government is now restricting the further growth of um, aquaculture industry. First, uh, solutions for these problems have to be found. Now, what is the background of the animal welfare problem? You may have heard of the salmon life cycle. And then the salmon life cycle and the mature animals spawn in freshwater rivers, and then the youngsters grow up in freshwater. 
But a problem in the fresh water is that there's not very much to eat. So what these animals then go through is a so-called smaltification process during which these freshwater animals turn into animals that are able to survive in the ocean, in the seawater. And that's a very big difference because in the freshwater, the iron concentration is much lower than in the blood, while in the ocean, the salt or iron concentration is much higher than in the blood. So all the osmoregulatory systems in freshwater fishes that are desperately trying to keep ions in the body have to be reversed because once you move to the ocean, you have to get rid of all the ions that enter your body because there's so much salt in the water. Okay, the animals can do that, but they have to go back for spawning. So while they are leaving the rivers because there's not much to eat and then enter after smortification the oceans and grow, to about two kilograms after one sea winter to about five kilograms after two sea winters. They then usually in the wild would stay immature, sexually immature while the body is growing. And only when they reach a certain energy reservoir, that's the signal for them. Okay, now we can afford puberty. And the body size determines that this is possible. And then they, uh, commence puberty, start puberty, and the increasing sex steroid levels associated with the start of puberty do two things. They start up germ cell production, so spermatogenesis, but they also start up the reversal of this multiplication because they know we have to leave the ocean and go back to the fresh water. So we have to reverse our osmoregulatory system again. So this time it is triggered by the increasing sex steroid levels. Now, if you have fish that become sexually mature in aquaculture facilities, that means that they lose the capacity to survive in the aquaculture facility, which is in the ocean, in the salt water. In the end, they will die because they can of course not leave the aquaculture facility, they are in a net. So for a fish farmer, sexual maturation is really bad news, in particular when it takes place before the animal has reached the harvest size. And that's the case in particular in males. In females, it's practically not occurring because females need a much higher energy input than uh, males. But in males, it's often occurring after just one sea winter and then the fish are too small. So what the fish farmer wants to have is a means to avoid early puberty. Okay, also if there's no puberty, they cannot reproduce with wild fish. That would also solve the problem. Okay, so looking at time, so I'll go on for a few more minutes before we have a break. So we take a look at how the startup of uh, spermatogen is regulated. And this scheme is something that can be used for all vertebrates. You have the brain that is uh, producing stimulatory and inhibitory input, and then integrated output then is provided to the pituitary, producing two gonadotropic hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And these two regulate the two main gonadal or since we're talking mainly about males, testicular functions, that is production of hormones and growth factors on the one hand and production of sperm on the other. So if we look at the situation somewhat more specifically in fish, then we have the situation that here is a, a gonadotropic cell in the pituitary and you have here the two gonadotropic hormones. And what makes this plate fish specific is the fact that in fish, but only in fish and not in higher vertebrates, you have the sex steroid producing lytic cells in the testis that respond to LH in all vertebrates, but in fish also to FSH. So both gonadotropic hormones regulate sex steroid production by lytic cells, and FSH is the only one that also activates Sertoli cells 
the direct contact cells of the developing germ cells. Now, sex steroids and FSH, which then changes growth factor production in Sertoli cells, so sex steroids activate receptors in Sertoli cells, FSH activates Sertoli cells to change growth factor expression. So steroids and FSH modulate Sertoli cell activity, which then in response changes paracrine factor production, which changes stem cell activity. So the fish specific situation is that steroids are produced uh, under the control of both gonadotropic hormones. So LH and FSH target lytic cell androgen production, and then steroids and FSH target Sertoli cell paracrine factor production, and they talk to germ cells. Now, CRISPR-Cas has allowed us to study that also on a genetic basis. And uh, as you may not be surprised in the meantime, is that when you lose the receptor for LH genetically, there's not much happening to experimentogen. It still goes on in fish, whereas in mammals it's blocked. And the fact uh, to explain that is that FSH stands in, produces the steroids required, and then the thing still happens. If you lose the FSH receptor, there is at least a delay of puberty because LH is still there, can promote steroid production, and also without the growth factors that's usually produced under the control of FSH, steroids are strong enough to stimulate eventually the startup of puberty, even though it is delayed. So in fish, you have to remove both FSH and LH receptor, and then of course the whole thing stops. Okay, so we have to conclude that FSH is the most important gonotropic hormone in fish. And uh, I'll show the next slide and then we make a break because the next slide brings us uh, to the first experiment. So we have lytic cells, and they produce some sort of factors. And here we have a stem cell that is surrounded by Sertoli cells and the Sertoli cells produce factors. And we want to know what are these factors that then either lead to self-renewal. So you get two stem cells and this one, this new one needs to find its own Sertoli cells to survive, or we get differentiation and then this uh, stays in this cyst, but this single germ so decides, okay, I'm now developing into a clone. The usual vertebrate situation is that LH regulates lytic cell activity, steroids, and perhaps other factors work on Sertoli cells, and FSH targets Sertoli cells and then decides which way to go. We have found now that the FSH receptor is also expressed by lytic cells, so FSH is the most important one supported by genetic experiments showing that removing LH does not change a lot. So after the break, I'll talk you through experiments showing how important FSH is and uh, how the startup uh, things uh, regulated by FSH uh, help us in uh, dealing with puberty and salmon. Okay, we have as time now 17 past 11. So shall we reconvene at 11.30? Is that okay? Okay, good. Then see you in a little bit more than 10 minutes. Yeah, and I'll pause the recording. Okay. So this is where we uh, stopped before uh, going on a short break. So we uh, came to the conclusion that it uh, makes sense to focus on FSH, which is then uh, what we did. We developed a primary test tissue culture system that is uh, technically very easy, but turned out to be very powerful. So this is a 24 well plate. And this is one of these wells. And then you see that in this well, there is an agar cylinder. And we make these agar cylinders by putting liquid agar into a 48 well plate and then wait till it's uh, cooled down so we can uh, take out the cylinder, put it into a 24 well plate. 
Then there is this piece of nitrocellulose filter paper. And on top of that is one adult zebrafish testis. And that goes for, uh, we usually use uh, not longer than uh, seven days, often for five days of culture. And this is perfect for uh, primary test tissue culture. Of course, each animal has two testes. So usually what we do is we have one testis incubated under control conditions, the other test is incubated under experimental conditions. So we have uh, always pairs. And then usually depending on uh, the parameter we study, we use six to eight for morphological work where the variation is smaller and uh, usually 12 for molecular work where you have somewhat higher uh, inter-individual variation. So what we wanted to see is how what is the role of FSH in controlling spermatogenesis, in particular the early stage? So we knew FSH works on lytic cells, they produce androgens, the androgens then work on the Sertoli cells, and they respond by producing some paracrine signaling. So we wanted to know what are these factors that then induce differentiation. And uh, we did these experiments and it worked very nicely. This is control condition, this is with androgens, and you again see brown cells that are indicating proliferation, very many more cells are proliferating and more differentiated cell types appear. But unfortunately, before we were finished, uh, this was studied by others. So we had to uh, uh, lay that to the side and focus on uh, the other aspect of FSH activity, namely that is not related to sex tier production, that is related to FSH effects on Sertoli cells that then produce paracrine factors, and in order to not mix it up with those that are produced by the androgens, because when we add FSH, we can, of course, not tell the FSH, you will only bind to the Sertoli cell. We cannot avoid binding it to the lytic cell as well in this tissue culture approach. So we added a chemical compound, trilostane, it's called, that prevents the production of biologically active steroids, which allows us to remove this influence, focus on FSH. Okay, so what are steroid independent effects on FSH? And this is just to give an indication on the proliferation activity and differentiation activity. So this is uh, such a piece of tested tissue cultured with trilostan, so no steroid production, and with trilostan, but then in the presence of recombinant zebrafish FSH. And as you see, there is a clear difference in the uh, proliferation activity. So FSH stimulates the proliferation and differentiation of spermatogonia independent of steroid action because steroid production was suppressed. So how does FSH do that? And to answer that question, we did an RNA sequencing experiment. So we used this tissue culture technique and we collected a number of testes incubated without FSH and compared uh, and looked at what genes are expressed there, simply all the genes that are expressed in this tissue and compared it to all the genes expressed in tissue that was incubated with FSH. And that uh, provided us with a list of differentially expressed genes. So either more or less than in the control situation. And after a bioinformatic analysis and so forth, uh, the results are published here in this paper we found that uh, several transcription factors and growth factors and signaling systems were uh, activated or inactivated, reduced in activity, altogether uh, responding to FSH that promotes differentiation. So I will uh, go with you through three of oh, the growth factors involved. And at the end of that, uh, you will understand what we want to say by this graphic here. We will talk about a new form of IGF that is present in the gonads of fish. We will talk about certain wind signaling uh, factors. So this uh, insulin-like growth factor family, wind growth factor family, and I'll also talk about one TGF beta protein, another growth factor family. Okay, let's start with IGF-3. Now, you will perhaps be familiar with IGF-1 and IGF-2 because these two IGFs are present in all vertebrates. 
But what you may realize or know also is that fish have undergone an additional round of whole genome duplication and that uh, many of these extra gene copies have survived. Many were lost, but also many have survived and have acquired a specific so-called subfunctionalization. Not an easy word. Okay, now IGF-3 uh, is one of them. Uh, uh, it, should, it should be called IGF-1b, theoretically, because it is a copy of the IGF-1 gene. So the regular IGF-1 should be called IGF-1a, and the new one should be called IGF-1b. But for historical reasons, the IGF-3, uh, as it was called initially, has survived. So the first thing we did is we looked at where is it expressed in the gonads. And to that, we did double immunocytochemistry. And here, the red is immunocytochemistry for um, protein that is present in the cytoskeleton of Sertoli cells. So what you see in the red channel is the cytoplasm of Sertoli cells. And all the black holes is the space where the germ cells would be surrounded by Sertoli cells. Now, the green is the uh, immunoreactivity to IGF-3. And if you overlap it, you see that most of the area that is red is green. So IGF-3 is produced or present in Sertoli cells, produced by present in Sertoli cells. And the only other exception is that in big type A spermatogonia, they also produce uh, IGF-3. So IGF-3 is a protein that localized to Sertoli cells and some uh, of the type A spermatogonia. And we were interested in that because it is one of the strongest responding genes to FSH. And since it is a new growth factor, and since we were able to produce the recombinant, so we saw a lot of uh, po potential in that protein. So having had the recombinant growth factor, we tested it in our tissue culture system, and we see that it has a strong stimulatory effect on proliferation and differentiation of the germ cells. So here you see the proliferation effect, number of brown cell types is much, much higher when you incubate with IGF-3, and it's mainly more differentiated cells, as we'll see later on. So we see that IGF, three stimulates a proliferation and differentiation of spermatogonia. And because this picture here was very similar to what we could achieve with androgen treatment, we just for security check that it is not that IGF-3 stimulates androgen production that then has the effect. And we have uh, found that in the presence of IGF-3, neither the basal nor the gonadotropin stimulated androgen production has changed. So IGF-3 does that on its own. It does not require androgen to do that. So now we knew FSH stimulates IGF-3 production by RNA uh, sequencing. And we know that IGF-3 protein promotes germ cell proliferation and differentiation. But is it indeed so that FSH makes the Tolly cell produce IGF-3 that then stimulates germ cell production. So can we really connect this chain all through its members? And that is a question that was answered by a PhD student, Roberto Moraes. He first showed that uh, FSH is stimulating IGF-3, not the other IGFs that are also expressed by the testers, only the IGF-3 is uh, stimulated. And that is the case if we allow steroid production or if we do not allow steroid production, although this is somewhat lower and we'll see in a minute why. Uh, IGF-3 also responds slightly to LH, but only when steroid production is possible. If we block steroid production, the LH effect on IGF-3 gene expression is blocked. So meaning that this is in fact a slight stimulatory effect of steroids on IGF-3 production, which is also explaining why we see a slight difference here. There is more IGF-3 produced when steroids are available, but there is still a big increase when steroids are not available. Okay. So now the 
experiments to really close the chain come. And here we show the BIDU labeling index of a certain type of spermatogonia in the presence of FSH. And if it is one, then it is the control level. So in the presence of FSH is nearly duplicated. And also when we add IGF-3, it is nearly duplicated. Now we found that there is a compound NVP that blocks IGF receptors. And if we do that, we can see that the effect that IGF-3 has is of course blocked because NVP blocks the IGF receptor. Now here is the critical experiment. And this is where we add FSH and the IGF-3 receptor inhibitor. And that shows us that the FSH effect is blocked by adding the IGF-3 receptor inhibitor, allowing us to conclude that indeed FSH triggers Sertoli cell IGF-3 production, which then stimulates spermatogonal proliferation differentiation in a steroid independent manner because all these experiments were done in the presence of Trilaster. Okay, so yes, we can answer that question. IGF-3 mediates part of the stimulatory effect of FSH. Now, one other family of growth factors I mentioned is the TGF-beta family, and uh, one of its members is the so-called anti-malarian hormone. Um, it's a growth factor that in mammals is responsible for making disappear the malarian ducts in males. Fish don't have malarian ducts, but they have this growth factor. So it's not always the namesake function that tells you what a compound does in a specific species. So this protein was there before and has obtained an additional function in the vertebrates that do have malaria in duct, but before that it had other functions. And these are those that we find here. So this example is that doing work in fish, you can find new functions of a protein. And then afterwards you can take a look at mammals. Maybe it also has an effect there, but nobody looked yet. So it still has to be looked up in, in mammals. So what do we find? We find that antimalarian hormone, like in all vertebrates, is also produced by Sertoli cells, just as IGF-3. And we have also found that AMH responds to FSH, but while IGF-3 is upregulated, AMH is downregulated by IGF-3. So we thought, hmm, maybe they are antagonists. So do they interact, these two? Again, studied by Roberto. And the experiments he did was that he incubated tissue either with IGF-3, and now under that is the control condition, and the experimental condition is it was also in the presence of AMH. So ha does AMH modulate the effects of IGF-3 is the question on the protein level. And indeed, we see that the mitotic index of a undifferentiated spermatogonia is reduced when we add AMH to IGF-3 and also those of the differentiating spermatogonia. While the number of these cells is not changing, the number of the undifferentiated cells, but the number of the differentiating cells is changing. So what we do see is here we have a, a reduction of the differentiating proliferation, but the proliferation that still does take place is self-renewal and hence no change in the stem cell population. And the difference in the proliferation we see here is that there is the differentiating proliferation that would have provided a differentiated that is blocked. Okay, that's on the protein level. So AMH inhibits protein effects. AMH protein inhibits IGF-3 protein effects. We also found that AMH either by RNA sequencing or by qPCR, it reduces the gene expression of IGF-3. So AMH is inhibiting IGF-3 all along the way, you can uh, say. So it seems to be a strong inhibitor, so strong that we studied in a very broad approach what I am AMH does, again, using RNA sequencing. Uh, this is a project from a postdoctoral uh, collaborator, Diego Crespo. 
And uh, he found that uh, AMH also inhibits androgen production. So all these genes with a green color coding here, they are downregulated by AMH. It increases the production of an inhibitory growth factor. Inhibin is the name, so it's an inhibitory growth factor. And it stimulates the expression of an enzyme producing prostaglandin E, and it stimulates the expression of the receptor for that. AMH stimulates the receptor expression and the ligand production, and the same genes were downregulated by FSH. So it's again these antagonisms. So what we see all together is that AMH has a strong inhibitory effect on IGF-3 production and action, on androgens, on other factors. It increases other inhibitory signals. So much of the effects that are under positive regulation by IGF-3 and androgens are under negative regulation by AMH. Now, then we come to the sort of integrative situation here that we have as a master control, the FSH from the pituitary that stimulates stimulators like androgen from lytic cells or IGF-3 from Sertoli cells, but inhibits inhibitors. We have seen that AMH inhibits steroid production. It inhibits uh, IGF-3 production and activity. And what I've not talked about, it also inhibits uh, uh, proliferation directly of uh, stem cell spermatogonia. So all these inhibitory effects are checked and kept in check by FSH. It, if FSH increases, it reduces the level of this inhibitor and it increases the level of all sorts of stimulators. That we found in zebrafish, but how about other species? And now we're slowly approaching the salmon. So we looked at that in salmon. And we went big right away because we used the microarray study. So again, an approach to uh, study general impression of testicular gene expression uh, at the beginning of puberty. And as, I, as I've mentioned in one of the earlier slides, the uh, energy reserves in the body is one of the parameters determining if puberty starts or not. So we had in this uh, experimental approach, two feeding levels, a uh, normal feed level that the fish get in the aquaculture situation and 40% of that, meaning they were not fed every day, but only three out of seven days for a number of months. And uh, then we, uh, in the period uh, following that, so the experiment started in September, so in, in the three to four months uh, after that, uh, they had the different feeding regimes. And at the end of the year or beginning of the next year, we collected samples from animals because that is usually the period during which puberty is initiated in salmon. So we had four groups, animals that did or did not start with puberty. And these two types of animals were found in both the high food and the low food group. So how did we find out that the animals were or were not starting puberty? That was found by, in two ways. We analyzed the proliferation activity of the testes and we either saw testes with very low proliferation activity, like here is a cell nucleus and here is a cell nucleus, that's basal proliferation activity. And here is increased proliferation activity. So the animals are in two bins, if you wish, no proliferation or very little and increased level of proliferation. Also, the same animals showed a low level of 11 keto testosterone androgen in the blood or an elevated level of uh, androgen in the blood. And now interestingly, co in comparison to zebrafish, they showed a low or a high level of IGF-3 in the testes. So these were parameters that allowed us to bin the animals into no puberty or beginning of puberty. And the results were uh, published here in this paper. 
So what we found is that there is a big, big difference in gene expression, testicular gene expression, between animals that showed a low or a high 11 keto testosterone level, 1,200 genes. However, we were surprised to see that there's very little difference between testicular gene expression in fish that got low food or high food. Nevertheless, we found, again, a big difference in gene expression in maturing testes when they were coming from the low food group compared to the high food group. And we were really puzzled by this sort of contradictory results. But we found out that this is mainly related to the following situation. So these 1260 genes here, they are represented by these 800 12 plus 450. And these 887 are represented by these uh, 450 plus 437. So we found that there is a big gene group, 450 genes, that is the same genes. And that these genes were popping up as differentially expressed because they were expressed at a higher level in the testes of the animals with high food, then in the testes that were pubertal, but got high food. Maybe I use it. So I don't know if it, in my memory, it seems as if I have made a mistake. So a much higher expression of these 450 uh, genes in the testes of the animals that went into puberty, although they got low food, compared to the level of expression in the testes of the animals that got high food. Also in the high food ones, these 450 genes were expressed at a higher level than in non-pubertal fish, but not so high as in the testes of pubertal low food animals. In other words, when a fish wants to get its testes into puberty with low food, it needs to crank up the expression of several hundreds of genes in order to be able to do that. While an animal that gets ample food can live with a medium increase in the gene expression level. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing that uh, is an example for how you get by applied research, because this was considered applied research, how you get back immediately into basic research, that became clear when we looked at these 1260 genes here in uh, closer detail. We used the so-called enrichment map analysis, and we were looking for the genes that were significantly overrepresented in so-called gene ontology categories. And we've, well, this is the type of uh, feedback you get from the analysis systems. And what I want to focus your attention on is that we repeatedly found several genes of the wind signaling system that are differentially expressed in the animals that just enter into maturation. Now, maybe you're familiar with the wind signaling system. If you're not, just a very brief uh, representation. The wind growth factors is a big family of growth factor proteins but they all interact with a membrane-associated receptor that is similar to the G-protein coupled family. It's called Frizzle, the receptor. And then when you have two major parts of the signaling system, one is called the canonical wind signaling system, and that's the system that uses beta-catenin as a signaling molecule. So when that is activated, beta-catenin uh, becomes... Uh, so available for diffusion into the nucleus and can then change uh, a gene expression. The other one is a so-called non-canonical signaling that uses uh, other transduction systems. Okay, now we were studying uh, the involvement in the beginning of puberty and we speculated that there might be a relation to IGF because of another PhD student, Diego Safian from Chile, and uh, he was very good in uh, bringing in um, uh, new literature. So the complete story that now refers to the beta catenin signaling and to other wind signaling is, uh, uh, was not part of his initial PhD program uh, idea, 
but uh, he devised uh, himself based on reading interesting literature. He found that there is a possibility of crosstalk between insulin signaling and uh, insulin-like growth factors make use of very similar receptors and the wind signaling system. And the crosstalk point is uh, this enzyme here, GSK3B. Now, beta-catenin is released in order to go to the nucleus and then stimulate gene expression when GSK3-beta is inactive. And it is rendered inactive by the wind that binds to frizzled, and then there is a signaling system that renders it inactive. If GSK is active, it recruits beta-catenin, so it's no longer available for diffusion in the nucleus. Also, beta-catenin becomes phosphorylated and then will be destroyed in the, in the cytoplasm. Okay, so there was the hypothesis that FSH maybe via IGF-3 somehow may use the wind signaling system. So in this experiment, I would like you to look only at the gray bars, not at the black ones. And here we show that when we add 100 nanogram of IGF-3 per milliliter into our tissue culture system, we get the activation of mitotic indices of all types of spermatogonia. And that leads to a depletion of the stem cells, but an increase of more differentiated cells. Okay, so far so good. Now we add a compound that renders GSK3 beta active. And since that blocks beta catenin signaling, that means that in the presence of this compound, we block this signaling. And what do we see when we add IGF3 and this compound? So when we only add IGF3, we have the stippled line here. So that's uh, activity one. But if we add the activator of GSK3 beta, or in other words, the inhibitor of canonical wind signaling, then we get a decrease in the mitotic index of the A undifferentiated and of the A differentiated, whereas by IGF3 alone, we have an increase. And if we look at the number of cells, where with IGF3 alone, we get a depletion of the stem cells. Now we get, when uh, the compound is present, we get an increase in the number of stem cells. So we get a complete inversion of the IGF3 effect when we block beta-catenin, when we block canonical wind signaling. So it seems that uh, IGF3 stimulates canonical wind signaling when promoting the differentiation of proliferating spermatogonia. But in which cells does it do so? So in order to do that, we made use of a reporter uh, line in zebrafish we had a zebrafish that expressed green fluorescent protein under the control of an artificial promoter that consisted of several response elements to this TCF uh, transcription factor. So that's indicated here, canonical wind signaling, and you need the beta catenin to interact with the TCF transcription factors, and we replace the regular gene that is expressed here by GFP. So when we have beta catenin uh, signaling activated, we get green cells. Now, when we do that under control conditions, there is, maybe you see it on your screen, just a little bit of green. And if we add IGF3, there's much more green in the tissue. And if you look at the cells, it's the type A spermatogonia in which that happens. And then we made, uh, we used the inhibitor of uh, beta catenin signaling. So here's IGF3, lots of green, just like here. But if we add the inhibitor of beta catenin signaling, the green is disappeared. So IGF3 activates beta catenin dependent gene expression in type A spermatogonia. So that was the story. I, uh, I have, of course, to thank for the funding, the European Union, which research council, the Brazilian and uh, Chilean PhD students had their own funding. The Utrecht University supports us. Uh, we collaborate with Weger in Macau and, of course, with all the people at the Bergen Institute. 
And at home, many things would not be possible with Jan Bogut. He's a molecular biologist. I am physiologist, a morphologist. So together we are a good team, but alone we are not very effective. Okay. So at the end, I have this game. If you want to look at it for some questions uh, that we might now be able to discuss, even though I spent too much time. Sorry. I hope you liked it. Okay. Yes. We now invite Dr. Hüdge Schutz for questions. We have several questions. Hello, Dr. Schulz. Hello, hello. Nice hello. to see you, uh, nice to see you Luis. <laughs> Thank you nice very much you. for accepting our invitation, for delivering this uh, presentation, and also taking your time to answer the questions. Yes, I see in the, in the chat there are already some questions. But, uh, yes, yes. So yeah. we, can, we can start, Luis. Yes. Yeah, we can go for the first one. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Gamzi Turan, I think. I, I, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing correctly, but let's go to the question. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is if we are able to produce one sex, female or male, zebrafish individuals today? Okay, so that's a question referring to sex differentiation. Uh, luckily, I know some of the answer. It's not my specialty, but... Uh, um, so, in zebrafish uh, strains that are established in the laboratories all over the world, uh, the sex determining gene that is present in wild populations has by chance been removed by crossings that happened in the like the 1970s or 1980s last century and all the strains that are now used in laboratories they come from from these initial crossings so they have lost the sex determination gene um, that is also the reason for the sometimes uh, uh, clearly deviating sex ratios you find, clearly deviating from 50-50 or one-to-one -one that you find in, uh, in aquarium facilities. So the main sex determining gene has been lost. There are other secondary or tertiary genes influencing the sex. And they are dependent in their expression level on the endocrine status, the temperature, the feeding level. So all sorts of things influence sex ratios. Uh, that is a very specific situation for the zebrafish. Okay, so if you want to have all male or all female zebrafish, that is relatively easy to do nowadays if your experimental system allows hormone treatment. Because if you put androgens in the water, then you get all males. And if you put estrogen in the water, you get all females. Now, in case you have a research question that does not allow to treat the fish with uh, steroids, then you may go to a genetic model. For example, it has been shown that the receptor for FSH if you remove that from the genome, then you get an all male population. So this would be a genetic uh, path towards an all male. I'm not sure. I don't. Well, I'm not sure if it is possible. In any case, I don't remember if there is a genetic mod modification you can do to get an all female. I only know about all male, but uh, that might be just uh, by chance. So yes, it is possible, but it is a very specific, particular situation in the so-called domesticated, if you wish, uh, uh, zebrafish, uh, related to the loss of the primary uh, sex determining gene. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Hafa, we can uh, jump to the next one. Yes. The next question, Hüdiger, it's from Tainara Maria. She said, very interesting work. I know that was not the focus of the analysis, 
But do you think that with induction or reduction of hormonal stimuli, you can observe changes in behavior? Yes, very likely. Um, again, there is uh, in zebrafish uh, genetic evidence for that, and in many other species, there is experimental evidence. Uh, where you can treat fish with uh, certain steroids or prostaglandins and then uh, watch for effects on behavior. But when uh, the question uh, refers to zebrafish, then uh, there is a genetic model, for example, where the enzyme that is required to produce androgens has been removed genetically. And then these fish still develop as males, but they also show spermatogenesis, by the way, which was quite surprising, but that, that's another story. So they do produce sperm, but these males, although having a testes producing sperm in normal numbers, these animals are not able to show the reproductive behavior that is required in order to make female zebrafish that carry ovulated eggs in their body cavity to position the eggs. So there is a certain type of uh, swimming behavior, a certain type of uh, approaching the, that the male approaches the female. And, and so if uh, this is a female, then the male comes and stubs from below or from the side to the, uh, to the belly of the female. And uh, that induces uh, egg laying in the female. So all this you do only see in animal, animals that do produce androgens. And if you have this uh, androgen loss uh, of function model, so to speak, so either removing the androgen receptor or removing uh, androgen production, then this behavior is not there. And you can induce it again by adding androgen to the water. So, yes, uh, in particular, sexual behavior is uh, clearly influenced by hormone levels. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, we have a uh, two parts question here from uh, Anna Luciari. Luciari, uh, Luciari uh, <laughs> great research presentation, Dr. Shoes. Uh, my question is, uh, as we know, uh, photo period is, is also a factor affecting puberty initiation in mammals. Does it affect fish? And then keeping fish under 24 hours light cycle in some laboratories may affect the reproduction later on. So we have these two part questions. Yes. So. In fact, I did not know that photoperiod affects human puberty, so it's always nice to learn something. <laughs> not human, sorry, mammals. Uh, yeah, oh, she, mammals, she yeah. Oh, mammals, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Sorry, yeah. Now, okay, in some mammals, of course, you have uh, photoperiod effects. Yes, okay. Right. So, um, the answer is yes, puberty is very important, but the relevance of the photo period input depends very much on the species. So usually the relevance of photo period uh, information is quite clearly seen in species that live far away from the equator. So anywhere where you have a clear difference in photo period between summer and winter, the chances are high that photo period signals are used by evolution to cue reproductive processes. So, for example, uh, I have in my personal research experience, I have uh, worked with uh, Atlantic salmon and with cod, two species in, in uh, the North Sea, in Scandinavia, so far away from the equator. The clear difference is in photo period over the year. And in both species, photo period has strong effects. But then the type of effect depends a lot on the individual species reproductive biology. So a long photo period, for example, and that the longest one you have is a 24 hour, of course, so that you ask in your second part of the question. A long photo period, when you apply it, to uh, salmon in spring 
it will strongly stimulate puberty. If you do the same in cod, it will strongly inhibit puberty. But the only difference, well, the only, there's many differences, but an important difference is that uh, the salmon reads um, a long photo period as spring and summer is coming up. And since the reproductive season usually is in October, November, that means for the salmon, I should shift my energy reserves towards bringing in uh, gonad growth. So uh, long photo period is a signal for the salmon to uh, start test growth. But then in the cod, the reproductive season is in the peak summer when the photo periods are longest. At that time, the testes and the ovaries usually are fully developed already in the months before. And they do no longer need the endocrine environment in order to stimulate gonad growth because it has already happened. So for this species, the same photoperiod signal will block the change to the endocrine environment required for starting the next cycle. So it will depend on the species that you have, and uh, it will, uh, is it at all sensitive to photo period? And yes, will it interpret it as a go or as a stop signal? It's very, very interesting. Uh, so we still have some questions from someone that you may very well know. Uh, oh. from uh, uh, Dr. Rafael Nobrega. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, you, uh, you read or I read? <laughs> no, I, I, can, I can make one uh, question because I, I, had, I have three, but maybe one to discuss uh, because uh, during this webinar, we have seen uh, the use of zebrafish as a translational model for human research, it, it was, it, it, it's more like uh, your opinion. Can we use zebrafish as a translational model for human reproduction studies, reproductive studies? What, do you, what is your opinion about that? Because zebrafish has cystic structures, the question of the gonadotropines and so on. That was my question. Yeah, it's, uh, it, so again, it depends, in general, as usual, it depends on the type of question you ask. So if you ask a very specific uh, humanized question, like related to pregnancy or to the presence of the uterus, well, of course, the zebrafish is not a good model. But if you ask very basic questions about uh, uh, activities of certain cell types, a granulosa cell or a Sertoli cell or something like that, then zebrafish can be a good model. But uh, uh, one should never expect it to be an ideal model. Uh, to make, I don't, uh, do we have time for a small uh, anecdote? Yes, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I remember uh, uh, um, I was at a biology of reproduction meeting in Baltimore many years ago, like 20 years ago. And since I knew the organizer, he invited me for sort of a, a private party where a number of the important people were there. So one of them was the uh, head of the uh, uh, this laboratory in the United States where all the rat and mice model are kept. What is it called again? Jackson? Jackson laboratory, right. Jackson. So, and uh, this person, after having had some drinks, <laughs> said <laughs> that uh, she, until now, had not understood why the mouse was considered to be a good model for medical research. But there is no other one where you can do gene knockout at that time. Now it's different, of course. So everybody thought the mouse is a good model, but it is not, of course, for many things in human research. So it, the, 
depends very much on the question that you ask. And I think that uh, the, uh, the more basic the questions are, the more likely it is that also a remotely related species can provide uh, significant information. And you can even leave the vertebrates and you can go to uh, beautiful models you have in Drosophila, for example, on stem cell systems. So, so yeah. yes and no, depending on the question, yes. <laughs> but very good answer. <laughs> Okay, maybe you want more, more Louise, and then we, okay, you can. Okay, next, next one. Uh, do you have uh, data or uh, information on germ cell growth factors that regulate their own uh, development or affect Sertoli cell function? Yeah, the, this is a, a very interesting question, and we hope we will be able to pursue that question in quite some detail in the near future. Um, the, there is uh, right now very limited information in that regard. Uh, when it comes to growth factors in the um, uh, strict sense of the word, then I know only of one example, and that is um, a growth factor produced, no, two examples, a growth factor produced by spermatocytes from, uh, it's a member of the bone morphogenetic uh, protein family, so TGF beta uh, signaling, produced by, uh, I thought, late spermatogonia, like type B e spermatogonia and primary spermatocytes that uh, influences the um, proliferation behavior of early spermatogonia. That is work done in mice. And uh, another growth factor also produced by germ cells has also been found in mice. That is a growth factor system where the ligand is introduced into the membrane and where the receptor is also in the main membrane of the neighboring cell. So this is a growth factor that is uh, not very uh, available for diffusion and for long distance signaling, but for signaling to just the next cell. Um, so these two examples I know with respect to growth factors uh, in the strict sense, but then um, germ cells, for example, participate in the production of retinoic acid, which again influences other germ cells, but also Sertoli cells and Leydig cells. So I, I think this is a uh, understudied aspect of how, what do germ cells contribute themselves to themselves. their development. And we have the last one that I, it's a question that I can uh, relate it myself very much with that because uh, it happened to uh, some of my results uh, in the lab is why gene expression sometimes did not correlate with morphometrical data. Yes, the answer to that is relatively easy theoretically, but then it takes a lot of work to prove it. So gene expression is uh, or can be an important uh, parameter, but in order to have a physiological effect, the messenger RNA needs to be translated into a protein, and then this protein needs to have an effect. Since there is also an X to expression of the gene, control of how the messenger RNA is used. And since there is also post-translational regulation of protein activity, there are at least two levels of regulation that come after the messenger RNA has been formed. And that is not necessarily moving in the same direction as changes in gene expression or mRNA production. So this is uh, explaining potential discrepancies between gene expression and then the observation of further downstream effects. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that gene expression is a expression 
mm. that uh, we misuse sometimes because uh, we should consider gene expression all the process, the production of the mRNA, the translation of the mRNA, uh, the, the protein function itself. So that would be all the uh, gene expression process. So I, I prefer to use mRNA levels for that situation and for MR, uh, mRNA levels, uh, I, I think we should look at these uh, differences between uh, mRNA levels and morphometrical data really carefully because uh, when you have really dramatic changes on the morphology of the organ, for example, uh, in my case, we, we, we had a dramatic uh, 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 pro self renewal scenario with the AMH expression really down. But what was happening there was maybe the number of AMH expressing cells, which are Sertoli cells, were also diminished yeah. a lot. But when we have a situation where we don't have a really dramatic change or on the uh, uh, gonad uh, or organ morphology, so uh, uh, would be more uh, like simple uh, uh, to explain, but uh, oh, yeah, actually yeah. more difficult to explain. But when you have this drastic, we can uh, interpret the result in a different way. I, I don't know if you would agree with me. Who did yeah. uh, I think that uh, uh, when you have a situation where an experimental treatment changes the cellular composition of the tissue you study, uh, changes in gene expression become more complex to interpret that's uh, simply the case yeah so but i do not agree with respect to the uh, broad understanding you give to the word gene expression <laughs> because gene expression by itself is clearly defined and is not even uh, reflecting uh, messenger rna levels because you can have changes in gene expression without changes in messenger RNA and vice versa. You can have changes in mm -hmm. messenger RNA, but the gene expression does not change. Mm -hmm. So um, gene expression is clearly defined and is much more narrow in the sense of uh, what's the activity of the promoter for uh, promoter enhancer system mm -hmm. for that gene. And uh, mm -hmm already the way to the uh, mature messenger RNA has a number of levels of regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, we have uh, one, one last question from Isabella. Mm. Thanks for the great presentation. Could you comment more on how to apply these findings in animal fare, uh, welfare laws and procedures? <sighs> something that is uh, quite far away from my okay so animal welfare is uh... oh, okay so the only context I have uh, is uh, that puberty in salmon production uh, can have a welfare um, aspect when this puberty occurs while the animals are in the ocean. So all salmon farms are in marine water, salt water, ocean water. This is the environment in which the main growth of the body takes place. And that's what a fish farmer is hoping to get. He buys a small fish, buys fruit, and then at the end he has a big fish and a profit. So the growth phase takes place in the ocean water. However, salmon migrate from the ocean to freshwater rivers for reproduction. In other words, when puberty starts, they automatically triggered by the hormonal changes uh, that accompany puberty, uh, they uh, trigger a change in their osmoregulatory system, getting prepared for freshwater. In the nature, they would usually start moving towards coastlines and go into rivers, but of course they can't when they're in a, in a breeding facility, because uh, the fish are not, will not want them sea disappear. 
Um, so they cannot leave the ocean, but their osmoregulatory system is increasingly unable to deal with a high salt concentration, so they will slowly die, which is a clear animal welfare problem. Um, therefore, quite some money and uh, research work is invested uh, in Norway and also in other places in order to understand the regulation of puberty and therefore to uh, with the aim to prevent the start of puberty, hence avoiding uh, coming up of this problem. While talking, I remember that there is one other aspect uh, related to the Netherlands, where lots of pork is found. And uh, one of the problems with male pork is that about a third of all consumers do not like the taste of boar meat after they have entered puberty. And uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, male pork are immunized against GnRH in order to prevent or at least delay puberty until they have reached slaughter size. So that will uh, prevent the loss of meat because uh, part of the consumers think it sticks. So... Um, that has, in fact, not much to do with animal welfare laws, but that would relate to procedures in your question, although I'm not sure if the procedures is just general procedures or animal welfare procedures. So uh, this type of work that uh, I am involved in is mainly in order to understand puberty with the aim to try to avoid it in the animals that are in production systems. Uh, in the salmon context, uh, in order to avoid the slow death due to uh, osmoregulatory problems. Okay, uh, I, I think that's all right, half, uh, right, yes. half, yes. yes, yeah, no more yes. questions. No more and questions. I would like to uh, thank you, Hutke, uh, for uh, the presentation. It's always nice to see the results that <laughs> I was there when they they were made. So <laughs> I'm really happy to see that. And uh, it's also uh, always a pleasure to uh, listen to you speaking. Uh, you, uh, in my point of view, one of the uh, greatest uh, speakers that I have ever <laughs> had the chance to. So uh, many flowers. Uh, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's true because you know me. <laughs> so <laughs> one more time, thank you very much. Hafa. Yes, thank you, Hudiga, again for accepting uh, our invitation and for taking your time for being with us. And uh, and answering the questions, I agree. I fully agree with uh, Luis. Very nice presentation, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I cannot say too many things, <laughs> but um, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It was uh, fun to participate and to contribute, and uh, I hope uh, the audience also liked uh, this uh, presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, we are done with the, the morning uh, session and um, in about one hour we restart with our third speaker, Dr. Paulo Gavaya, and uh, I'll see you in, uh, in one hour exactly. And I, I also want to thank um, my co-chair, Luis, for having and uh, thank you very much for the audience and uh, see you in one hour. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos, é proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e principalmente com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. 
Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável, que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para assim oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move, porque para Alesco, pesquisa é para a vida.